at the dawn of the Age of Gorgons. The great continent was torn asunder, and in its place its once earthly heart was naught but the endless sea. There arose men, the grandchildren of the gods, and fate would see their hands to many great and terrible things. Things I learned today. I cannot do a Mako impression to save my life. The genre of fantasy has many subgenres within it, from the contemporary to horror to the usual high and low fares. However, because of the influence of Tolkien's work in early fantasy roleplaying, and by extension D&D, many fantasy games opt to use the high fantasy affair, which I have dubbed the Tolkien melting pot. While D&D may have taken nods from a lot of sources, ultimately it played in the realm of high fantasy. Today's game, however, does not claim to fall into that category opting instead for Swords and Sorcery. Swords and Sorcery is one of the more enduring subgenres of fantasy, even though the term was only coined in the early 60s. Unlike high or more epic affairs, Swords and Sorcery tends to place greater focus on personal stories with in-moment dangers and exotic settings. In other words, a smaller relative scale in its adventure, but no less dangerous or brutal, and in some cases even more so. That brings us to today's review subject, Savage Kingdoms. The first few chapters compose the introductory part of the book, establishing the game's intended tone and its timeline. Said timeline is presented here as both a series of ages reflecting the dominant species at that given point, and a more specific timeline of events through multiple calendars. After that, the game briefly goes into the core mechanics. Now, despite what the name would imply, Savage Kingdoms is a d20-centric game, and said die is the sole randomizer in the mechanics. However, instead of a natural 20 or 1 being an automatic success or failure like in the more popular D20 system, it is instead a respective exploding or imploding die, wherein you roll the die again and add or subtract the result. Rolls for attacking, resistance, and skills all use this system. You are determined to have a critical success if your final result is at least 20 points higher than the difficulty of the task, or 20 points below in the case of a critical failure. I do like this approach since it essentially states I'm that damn good rather than just being lucky. One aspect presented in this chapter I will give them credit for is the fact that defense is dodging and or parrying, not solely based on armor. By doing this they get around that bizarre nature of armor class in D&D where heavy armor somehow helped you evade. The next chapter delves right into character creation. Savage Kingdom uses a lot of point buy in this, but I'll get into that a bit later. Step 1 in character creation is to generate your core attributes. There are 6 attributes in total and you have 30 points to spend between them, with the allowed range spent between 2 and 9, though you can go higher after character creation. The 6 attributes are as follows. Agility, Physique, Vigor, Intellect, Magnetism, and Willpower. Step 2 is to calculate one's derived traits, which are the following. Hardiness, Health, Initiative, Luck, Mobility, Renown, Resolve, and Stamina. Hardiness and Resolve are the character's physical and mental resistance, respectively, while Luck can be considered the game's extra effort trait. Spending Luck can be used to invoke a reroll, or reduce an attack, or prevent equipment from being destroyed. Step 3 is to choose one's race, or in the case of human characters, culture. The choice either way will grant a set of bonuses to the character's abilities, a set of skill specialties for free, and modified character point costs or bonuses for specific talents and weaknesses as well as a starting set of gear. Step 4 is to choose a character's talents, which are the game's equivalent to feats in some ways, but different in others. Characters gain 10 points to spend on their starting talents, most of which range from 1 to 4 points in cost, some talents being unavailable at character creation. Talents are further categorized into General, Bloodline, Battle, and Magic. Step 5 is to choose a character's weaknesses, if any. A character's choice of weakness can provide bonus points to spend on talents or skills, but characters cannot begin play with more than 5 bonus points total. The exception to this is cases where races or cultures require a specific weakness. The final step is to choose a character's skills. A character's starting skill points are equal to their intellect attribute plus 20. Every 3 points a character spends on a skill, they may choose a specialty listed under it, which grants a plus 2 bonus when making skill rolls with the relative specialty. 
In addition, putting points in a given skill may grant special effects beyond the skill level when rolling, or may boost complementary skills. A final note with the character creation section is life paths. Now, Savage Kingdoms does not have character classes, being a very freeform game. However, it is willing to throw a bone for those who want a more stable foundation in the form of life paths, which acts as a starting package of suggestions when playing a certain archetype. Actions and combat is the next major section, and its content is fairly self-explanatory. In a given combat round, you may have only one primary action and two simple actions each round, barring certain talents or the use of luck points. Complete actions, on the other hand, take your entire turn to undergo, and finally there are reactions, which are obviously actions taken outside of your turn. The remainder of the chapter details combat, which works in a near-identical fashion to most D20 fantasy works. Initiative based from highest to lowest, attack versus defense, etc. The main difference is damage, dealing an equivalent to the difference plus or minus the damage modifier of the weapon. Armor in this case acts as damage reduction. Near the end of the chapter, a basic encounter table is provided here. The next few chapters function as the setting material for the game. The first is orders and sects, which can be thought of as an alignment system in a very loose sense. The chapter details a number of secret societies, religious orders, and militant companies in the game's setting. Each one has a set of ranks based on a character's renown or age, granting benefits based on one's rank. Of course, joining an order can only be done if you meet the order's requirements, and you lose the benefits if you break that order's code. Finally, one can only commit to one order at a given time. Following that is a gazetteer of sorts on the Savage Kingdoms themselves, specifically the Savage West. This gives details on the kingdoms, realms, and geography of the land, as well as notable persons and what food or drink is common in those areas. After that, there's a detailing on the more cosmological side of the game's setting, which includes the nature of the seven disciplines of magic, the supernatural realms, and the myriad of faiths presented in the world. After that, the game's magic system is presented in further detail. Magic in swords and sorcery settings is intended to be presented as difficult, dangerous, and poorly understood. Much like many of the combat talents, magic in Savage Kingdoms is stamina-based, rather than being based on charges. Casting a spell is a skill roll, using the appropriate magical art skill according to the spell's discipline, versus a target number. Regardless of success or failure, the caster spends stamina points based on the spell used, spending half if on a failure. It's worth noting that many of the spell entries are multi-purposed and multi-effect. Conjure Flame, for example, can create fire on combustible objects, but it may also be used to make a flaming punch or to grant melee weapons a fire enchantment. As with skills, each spell has additional effects if you perform a critical success or a critical failure on the casting roll. The next major section is the game's equipment chapter. While this is focused on weapons, armor, and other possessions, it starts with two options for a character's starting gear, which I have dubbed the simple method and the complex method. The simple method has a set of basic items and 10 additional picks from a short equipment list, whereas the complex method has you begin with 75 pieces of silver, plus an additional 5 for every point of renown you have. Weapons and armor's main contribution in this is a set of bonus to damage and damage reduction, respectively. However, weapons have a set maximum damage they can inflict in a given attack. At the tail end of this chapter, there's a few examples of item quality and legendary items, but no real mechanics for making your own, sadly. Next we have the game's mini bestiary, although a full bestiary is included in a separate book. Many of the entries in this have special abilities and weaknesses unique to them, but they still use the same general mechanics players do. Also, each entry is a challenge level, but this is less of a matter of XP budgeting and more of the general power level of that particular entry. Next is a section on experience and advancement. Instead of XP being based on encounters, it's primarily gained through role-playing, adventure risk level, and the player's engagement, ranging from 1 to 10. At a set tier of total XP, characters will gain a bonus to attributes, derived traits, renown, talents, or skills, depending on the tier. It should be noted that advancements like derived traits and skill points can only be added to a given ability once, so you can't just dump the whole bonus into a single skill, for instance. The final chapter is a brief set of Game Master advice, from role-playing to combat, ending with a set of optional rules ranging from double criticals, parry bonuses to weapons, and skill specialties as advancements. 
In a similar matter to D&D 5th Edition, Savage Kingdoms is one of those games that I came into asking a specific question. In this case it was, how well does this game establish its sword and sorcery aspects? Having read through the book and done some testing, the conclusion I come to is... almost. To explain why, I need to bring up an important aspect of my gaming philosophy. System does matter. In this context, the mechanics have to match the setting presented. For the most part, when it comes to the multiple kingdoms and organizations, the setting works quite well. However, I think too much of the supernatural aspect, from some of the larger beasts to some of the more vanilla fantasy races included, work against that sword and sorcery vibe the game is going for. As a result, the game's mechanics don't quite reach that same potential, coming off as a hybrid of AD&D and the Omni system. I think having some sort of wound system or spell mishaps would go a long way to aiding the system and reaching that sword and sorcery it's aiming for. Though I don't want to undersell it. The mechanics presented here are very strong and have some good ideas throughout. It just doesn't completely match up to its stated goals. So all that said, I give Savage Kingdoms the only thing I can. A 7 out of 10.